All right, anyway, uh, Mark chapter 8. So we're going to begin a new series today entitled The Great Exchange. And much like what we saw at Christmas, there were conversations before the birth of Christ that told us that his birth was coming. Not just the birth of a child, but the child, the Christ child. And the conversation started out that people really didn't know what was going on. They knew something unique was going on. They saw some miraculous signs ahead of time. But at the birth of the Christ is when all the pieces kind of came together. We see the same thing at the crucifixion of Christ as we get closer to Easter. There are conversations that happen, and as they start, like we're going to see in Mark chapter 8 today, people's heads are just spinning going, wait a minute, this doesn't measure up, this doesn't make sense. But the more conversations and the more that the story begins to unfold, the more clarity we have into what Jesus was telling us in the fulfillment of prophecy and the fulfillment of scripture from thousands of years before Christ even came. The more we look into it, the more we see, the more we'll understand what this great exchange looks like. But it doesn't happen all at once. It kind of unfolds. And it's going to be the same thing, uh, same theme with the board behind me. Right now, you're looking at it and you don't see much. I call it January in Wisconsin. But little by little over the weeks, there's going to be a picture that begins to develop. And some people have already come up and said, I think I see the picture. There is no picture there, okay? (laughs) So you can try all service long. There is no picture. Uh, But just as with this message series, this picture is going to develop behind us. And then on Easter, all of the pieces should begin to snap into place. Now today we're going to start with a conversation Jesus had with his disciples as they took a little walk outside of Galilee. Mark chapter 8, we're going to begin at verse 27. And as we read, we're going to stop at different points in the passage to bring some things to light that are in that part of the passage. Mark chapter 8, beginning with verse 27. It says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. First break, let's talk about this. So Jesus and his disciples are in Caesarea Philippi, which is about 25 miles away from Galilee. Galilee is where Jesus did most of his teachings. It's where he's from. It's where most of the miracles took place. Jesus and the disciples have done a little bit of a road trip, an excursion away, and and they go into Caesarea Philippi. Now, Caesarea Philippi is named after Caesar, the leader of Rome, and also himself, self-labeling, a deity, believed he was God, a god. And it's also named after Philippi. Philip is the son of Caesar. So as they walk through the city and they go around the streets, they would have seen a church on every street corner. It's not church as we think of church. It wasn't a Catholic, a Lutheran, a Presbyterian, a Baptist. It was all different temples of worship for all different gods. It would have had almost a carnival-like experience as as there were trinkets dedicated to certain gods that you could take and bring home for good luck. There were other temples where there were pictures and images and and graven images of other gods that you could go in and worship and incense would be burning. There were other temples where there were prostitutes inside where you could go and worship that god with a prostitute. It would have been a crazy experience for them to walk through, especially coming from a smaller region like Galilee. And as they went through the city, they would have looked up on a hill, and above the city of Caesarea Philippi, there was a large statue of Caesar. And everyone understood who Caesar was, and everybody understood that that statue was there to remind you who's in charge and who you worship. And as they're walking through the city and they're looking at all of these images and all of these temples, Jesus stops, and, and the Bible tells us that he asked the question, who do people think I am? You're looking at all these deities. You're looking at all of these different faces and and gods and goddesses. Who do people think I am? And the disciples start automatically by giving other people's voices. Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some think you're Elijah. Some think you're one of those other prophets. And Jesus quickly flips the script on him and says, okay, that's what they say. Who do you think I am? And we don't get a time frame. It never says how long the pause was. 
It never says if anyone else was, uh, was going to speak up as well. But Jesus asked the question, who do you say that I am? Now, I look at this, and, and, and I read it, and, and we know now Jesus knew that there was a death in his near future. He knew his time on earth was, was short. He knew that the crucifixion was coming, and he had put the baton in the disciples' hands. You guys got to get this because you're carrying this message out. And part of me wonders if the human side of Jesus got a little nervous if they understood or not. Part of me wonders if Jesus asked this question and and what it would have been like if the disciples would have gone, we don't have a clue. (laughs) You know, you did some cool stuff, that walking on the water, we love that. And that fish and bread and multiplying and everyone eats. Can you do that with cheese curds? (laughs) Part of me wonders if Jesus was a little nervous if they would get it. But then it says Peter states out and he says, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. Matthew's account of this same event, Matthew's account says that Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, because you didn't get this from your flesh and blood. The Holy Spirit of God gave you this revelation. He's the one who told you about who I am. Simon gets it, and and I kind of pictured disciples like knuckle bumping Peter on the side. You got it, Peter. You know, nice call. And, uh, you know, here's Peter. I don't know what it is about Peter, but his boldness just, just, makes a mark on everything that he does. Peter gets out of a boat and walks on water. No, the other disciples did that. Peter, Jesus asked a question, and, and who's the first one to blurt, blurt out? Peter. None of the other disciples are listed as doing that. Peter's impetuousness just kind of puts him on the edge, and, and because of that, Jesus says, you're no longer Simon, you're Peter, and it means rock. And upon this rock, the words you've just said, I'm going to build my church. And Peter's like, yeah, I'm the rock. <laughs> and all the other disciples are probably looking at him and going, man, he's so brave. He steps out. He's the rock. This comes to light. But then Jesus in this conversation, in the same conversation in Mark 8, he drops a bomb on the disciples. Yes, I'm the Messiah. And now I'm going to die. Let's begin reading verse 31. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Now this word rejected, it means to fail their scrutiny or to disappoint Jesus didn't measure up to what the chief priest and the religious rulers and the lawyers, ah, that's not what we were expecting. He was rejected by them. And then verse 32, it says, he spoke, referring to Jesus, he spoke plainly about this. That word plainly, underline it, highlight it, score it. He spoke clearly. Jesus didn't mince, mince words. The word here for plainly is with unreservedness, openness, frankness, non-concealment. No ambiguity, no figures of speech or comparisons. He spoke freely, confidently, boldly, with assurance. Jesus said very clearly, here's what's going to happen to me. He left nothing to be disguised or nothing to be guessed. And this would have rocked their world. They had an understanding of what Messiah was supposed to be. We'll talk about that in a moment. But it wasn't supposed to be someone who came to die. Peter takes Jesus aside And the passage tells us, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Not question him, not doubt him, not have uh, concerns. He rebukes him. The word rebuke in in the Greek, which this was written in, it means to to strongly forbid, to condemn, to punish, or to tell off. Peter takes Jesus aside and says, hey, remember? I'm hearing from God here, I'm the rock, and you're not doing this. You're not going through this. This isn't what messiahs do. Messiahs don't die. There's no dying in deity. (laughs) Verse 33, it says, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Peter, if you're going to give it, you better get ready to take it. And he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Get behind me, Satan. 
He goes from being a rock who's heard and speaks for God that in the next breath, he's Satan. The Pharisees are never called Satan. Prostitutes are never called Satan. Tax collectors are never called Satan. Nobody gets a harder charge in the Bible, a harsher penalty statement than Peter right here. Get thee behind me, Satan. This is the same temptation Satan gave Jesus in the wilderness. Go up on the mountaintop. Cast yourself down. You don't have to die. You won't die there. And the word play here with what, what Jesus says and what apparently Peter's response was is in reference to what Satan had said to Jesus on the mountaintop. Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. The word here for Satan is the same as devil. The word is adversary. You are not thinking about the ways of God. Let's bring this home for just a minute. Have you ever in your life had those moments, maybe you were in church, and the service just clicked, and the worship clicked, and you got those Jesus goosebumps on your arm, and, and you're like, now I'm ready to go out and take on the world, and, and you've got the mind of God, and you're thinking on the passage, and you get out to your car, and before you're out of the parking lot, the kids are arguing in the back seat. Your wife is telling you, I don't know what we're having for lunch. It's on you. And you're like, I don't know. And, and the arguing starts. And then the youngest fills the diaper before you even leave the parking lot. And every heavenly thought goes out the window with the aroma. <laughs> we quickly can go from rock to Satan. Have you ever been in your personal quiet time and you're reading your Bible and maybe like Brady said, you're in 2 Timothy and you're challenged and you're like, God, I won't have a spirit of timidity or fear today, but I'll walk in power, love, and self-discipline. And you've got the word of God in you and you're excited to take on the day and you're dressed and you got your coffee and you get in your car and you turn the key and nothing happens. And the words out of your mouth are not the words of 2 Timothy. <laughs> and you quickly go... From rock to Satan. You get to work and your boss is in your face for being late and the very person you don't want to see is the one who walks right in front of your desk. And everything you've built up and everything you've taken from God's word or heard from the Lord is out the window. You don't have the things of God in mind. You've had a good day. You're thanking the Lord for a good day. No one is sick. No one got hurt. Things went well. And all it takes is one person to post something on Facebook that you see, and you can quickly go from rock to Satan. Oh, I'm going to tell them what I think of what they just wrote. <laughs> rock to Satan. How many of us have that same struggle? We can find ourselves in the same place. Jesus said, it's when we don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So now Peter, let's go back. He's just gone from being the messenger of the Holy Spirit to being Satan incarnate. And on top of this, his head's still swimming from the fact that the Messiah I've been backing, the one who's supposed to be the savior of our people, has just told us he's going to die. Jesus had never mentioned dying before this point. This is the first time it ever comes up. And they're listening to the message and they're like, whoa, 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 back up. What's this about dying? See, mankind's Messiah doesn't die. Mankind's Messiah answers everything the way we want. Mankind's Messiah steps in and gives victory. The gods of the Egyptians, of the Romans, of the Greeks, their gods fought battles and, and won things in the heavenlies. Their gods didn't die. Jesus, what's this about you dying? Not only was it a death, but it was going to be a shameful death. There's one point in, in, the, uh, in the Gospels where Jesus is talking. He says, we're going into the city, and, and one of his disciples says, we might as well go with him too. If he's going to die, we're going to die. Let's, let's die together. And it's kind of a, an honorable, we're, we'll go out together. But this is a shameful death. It's a crucifixion. Crucifixion was saved for the worst of criminals the most degrading of all of society. And they would either put you on a high point of the city to be seen, or they would put you at an intersection of a major road so that everyone walking by or riding by on their animal would see you. And once that cross went in the ground, you would be close to eye level, stripped down to nothing. For anyone walking by to say whatever they want, to spit on you, to abuse you, 
It was a horrible way to go out. And at the same time, as we played as kids, it's a game of follow the leader. Because not only is Jesus about to be crucified, Peter is going to be crucified. Peter is crucified upside down. And in the same way, we think, well, if we're following the Messiah, everything's going to go right for us. It should all just click into place. No, Jesus said, look, I came as the suffering servant, the suffering son of man. And if we're playing follow the leader and he went through that, guess what's going to happen in our life too? Amen. It didn't all make sense to them at that point. It's confusing, and the picture for the disciples, especially for Peter, would have been incredibly blurry. They wouldn't have understood it. Last night, someone came up, actually a couple of people came up to me and said, yeah, I didn't get it. How's Peter supposed to know this? That's the point. In week one, in the first time Jesus says it, it's totally confusing to them. Nothing has been displayed. Nothing is, has kind of unfolded yet. The picture still has no ink on the boards, no paint on the boards. Peter's just trying to wrap his mind around what had been said. And just like this series and the message today, Peter and we don't always understand all the answers. But at least in this conversation we'll look at today in Mark 8, there's two prevalent themes that are unveiled. Here's the first one. The first one is Jesus died, we die. Jesus died, we die. One writer said the vocation of messiahship is the vocation of suffering and death. We're playing a game of follow the leader, like master, like servant. Jesus died, we die. It becomes our responsibility to follow the leader. Paul clarifies this in his writings throughout the New Testament. I'm going to give you some passages. You can write them down if you'd like. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. It says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. It says, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. I've taken everything I have, and I've put it at his feet. I put my life at his feet that I can live for him. Romans chapter 12, verses one and two. It says, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the, mercies of God, uh, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. If it's a sacrifice, then it has to die. Amen. It's not a sacrifice if it doesn't die. We present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Jesus died, we die. Christ knew what was coming. He knew that the cross was in his future. And what does that say will be in our future? A death. A death to ourself. The only way to save your life is to lose it. Amen. What does this even look like? Jesus died, we die. But here's the second part of the equation. Jesus lives, we live. Jesus lives, we live. Once again, like servant, uh, like master, like servant. Romans 6, 8 says, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Let's pick up reading Mark 8, verse 35. Jesus says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. When we give up our life, that's when we get our life back in its fullness. And as Paul said earlier, we are called to live and live life in Christ. I think so many times as Christians, we wake up in the morning and the first thing on our mind in our walk with Jesus is our checklist. I can't do this today. I can't think about that. I can't talk to this person. I can do that. And we make our, our relationship with Christ this checklist. When, when we wake up in the morning, the first thing on our mind, and this is a challenge I'm going to give you, is thank God for the love of Jesus. Amen. 
Thank God for the life I have because of Jesus' death. He died and I died, but now he now lives and I can live. And I can love, live because he loves me so stinking much. Every day you wake up to a bear hug from God. Not just a little church pat hug. It's one of those bear hugs where you're squeezed so tight that the veins on your neck pop out because you can't breathe and you're shaking. One of those. Anyone else ever gotten one of those? All right, some of you have. You know what I'm talking about. It's a bear hug from Jesus every morning because he loves you that much. Can you turn to the person beside you and just tell them, you are so stinking loved by Jesus. When's the last time you used stinking and Jesus in the same sentence? Let's read on, verse 36. Jesus says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or who can, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? What do we have to bring to God? I mean, this is God. What do we have that we bring that we can lay before him and he'd go, ooh, I'll trade you for that. We bring ourselves and the best thing we can do is let ourselves die. Our wants, our desires die. Verse 38, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Here's the great exchange. Here's what the next five, four weeks are going to be about. The great exchange is death for life and life for death. Death for life and life for death. If we're trying to live in our own strength and go after our own things, we may think we're alive now, but it ends in death. If we're willing to die to ourselves now and leave our wants, our desires, our flesh side, leave those behind and die to those, then we will live. Death for life. Life for death. Some of you are here today, and Easter and Christmas tends to bring this out, you're looking for God. You've tried religion. You've tried the ceremonial services. And you've tried the checkbox events. And you've tried the formalities. And there was no life in it for you. And there won't be. Because it's not about the formality. It's about relationship with a God who loves you so stinking much. Amen. That's going to be the subtitle of this series. <laughs> Here's my challenge to you. Over the next four weeks, and I would challenge this to all of us, and I throw myself in this mix, let's have our hearts and minds and eyes open to see the love of God and the great exchange happen in Scripture, and then how it happens for us the week after Easter. I'm really excited about that message, because it said, the disciples said, when he talked to us, this is after the resur resurrection, didn't our hearts just like burn within us? Weren't we so excited by what he said? Let's let the series develop. Let's see the words of, of Christ develop as he points toward the cross, as the picture behind me will develop. Let's allow our lives and our hearts and our minds and our ears to say, God, speak to me, that I may die and you may live.